Well, hello, everybody. I hope you are doing well today. I am Jackie Page from 93.9 WKYS. and want to welcome you to another edition of Girl Talk Live, where we talk about all things affecting women. And today, um, we're talking about heart disease in women and women of color, because this disease is the number one killer of women. And women of color are at particularly higher risk than other races. So what are some things that we can do to prevent this? How do you know if you have heart disease? This is a conversation you know I cannot have by myself, and I am so excited to have Dr. Clarence Finley joining me today. How are you doing today, Dr. Finley? Not too bad. Thanks for having me. No, thank you for joining. Um, you know, it's a lot for us to dive into today um, about heart disease and, and what we as women, um, especially women of color, can do. So, you know, one of the things that I've noticed and I've heard is that heart disease is an issue that plagues men and not really women. Um, why is that misunderstood? I, I don't know. I think it, part of that can't stem from some of the early studies and, and it's more of a historical thing. Um, you know, the, the, the traditional notion that females are protected, this goes back to, you know, studies that were done in the 50s, 60s and 70s. Um, females are protected from heart disease. Uh, that was sort of the traditional teaching. But over time, we've realized that things have actually changed. Uh, and, um, you know, at this point in time, heart disease is the number one killer for all Americans. And then when you start to break things out and look at subgroups, it's extremely high in blacks and, uh, and, and quite high in females as well. Obviously, black men are a little worse from that standpoint. Uh, and so there is a definite signal uh, to the fact that, you know, heart disease is alive and well, and it takes and claims the lives of, of uh, women in, uh, in, in equal proportions to men. So, uh, you know, that has definitely been dispelled and we're, we're dealing with the new era for sure. Yeah, most definitely. Um, recent research shows that 50% of African-American women over the age of 20 have heart disease and 40% have high blood pressure. 20 is young. That's like super, super young. Why? Are women of color affected by heart disease so early? I think the, the first thing to do is to take a step back, right? And so a lot of some of that data actually comes from the fact that they used to do sort of this gets back into kind of med school. But basically, when they take, you know, frozen sections of individuals who've died prematurely, so at, at very young ages, even in their teens, and they look at portions of their body, the aorta, which is the main vessel that comes out of the heart and heart arteries, they already start to see signs of atherosclerosis, which is really the hallmark of heart disease. And that's where you have a deposition or laying down of cholesterol and fatty uh, components into the, to the blood vessel, and that creates a blockage. And so we can see some of this very early on. Now, you layer on that a lot of the comorbidities. And what I mean by comorbidities is really the additional diseases that uh, tend to affect uh, uh, the black community in high numbers, uh, in particular diabetes, high blood pressure, strong family history of heart disease, um, that uh, sort of perfect storm, if you will, it, uh, uh, creates a scenario where you're starting to see elements of this disease very early on, even in the 20s, uh, in, in individuals who are supposed to be protected, right? And so again, this, is, this dispels that myth or that notion and we can tell very early on that it's uh, some of our habits are starting to creep in and some of our genetics are starting to creep in and create scenarios that that are going to wreak havoc for us in the future. Yeah. Now, I just mentioned that, you know, 20 is, you know, a really early age. Are you seeing it in any of your counterparts seeing it happening earlier? So maybe I'm like, you know, 16, 17. Oh, mm -hmm. No, I think that's a good, uh, good question. So most of I think what that talks about is really signs of it. In terms of it actually manifesting, getting to the point where it's significant enough that it warrants intervention, um, you know, it's it's very uncommon that we'll see it uh, in the 20s. If we do, it generally tends to be males. Uh, you know, I personally have treated uh, uh, males and females in their early 30s, 30 between 30 and 33, either having received the stent or needing to go on to bypass surgery. But that that particularly the female who was that young had some other issues in terms of diabetes as a backdrop. Um, and that's what contributed to that individual. They clearly had type one diabetes, which is a different form than, than, than you know, when we talk about diabetes, the one that most of us are referencing. Um, so, so that patient was a little bit uh, of a, uh, you know, a normal scenario, but we do see it uh, definitely in individuals as young as in the thirties, twenties would probably be a little too young to see it. I mean, it's not impossible, but you know, the risk drops significantly in that category. 
and definitely teens, uh, you rarely see it in that scenario. Gotcha. What are some of the signs um, to look out for or things that we should know as far as like, hey, I may be, and you mentioned some like pre-signs. What are some of like the pre-symptoms and pre-signs that we need to be mindful of to say like, hey, we need to go get checked or we need to get this, we need to figure this out? Excellent question. So, uh, you know, I think uh, the first thing to start off is sometimes some patients will experience just fatigue, noticing that they're really run down after activity that they used to be able to do maybe six months ago without any issue. Uh, you know, carrying in groceries from, from, from the store, extremely fatigued, wiped out, really felt like they just ran a marathon type of fatigue, not just a little tired. Um, so that's a potential sign. Something we call exertional dyspnea. And that basically is whenever I exert myself, I become short of breath. Okay. Uh, and in that scenario, uh, you'd have individuals who try to climb a flight of stairs or uh, walk up a, a, an incline on a hill and they notice they're getting extremely short of breath, have to stop and rest, recover, and then they can continue on. And that's another potential sign or hallmark of heart disease. The other things to mention are that uh, individuals can get chest discomfort, all right, particularly with some form of exertion. So whether they're exerting themselves, they'll get uh, chest discomfort that can be characterized as a pressure or a heaviness or a gripping sensation or a sharp stabbing pain in the chest that then radiates out you know, to the shoulders, out to the actual arms, into the back, up into the neck or jaw, that potentially is a sign. And uh, obviously since you know, this, this uh, uh, um, uh, recording is really about how women are affected differently, I wanna make sure that we bring up some hallmarks and how women are affected differently. That's sort of the classic scenario that I described and in, in particularly in men, this is where you know, a lot of the initial studies uh, looking at heart disease and heart attacks and how they present, this is what they look at. But when we look at females, sometimes we see some things that are a little bit different. And so instead of scenarios where it's exertional, uh, you know, some form of exertion, climbing up a uh, flight of stairs or walking up a hill, it could be an emotional stress. So somebody makes you extremely upset and then they'll start to have chest discomfort, right? So that's a sign. And it's often, you know, sometimes a little bit more seen in females that there may be something going on. And as, you know, the stressor resolves, that chest discomfort improves. The other things to mention are that uh, with exertion uh, and after meals, uh, females will complain of indigestion. They'll say, I took Tums and it went away. I, it's fine, doctor, there's nothing to be concerned about. But in fact, it's a weird thing. You know, Part of what causes a heart attack is really decreased blood flow to the heart. When we eat a meal, we pull blood away from other parts of the body to help digest that meal. And so you're effectively pulling some blood away from that ordinarily would go to the heart. Uh, you're pulling it away. And so now you have a scenario where you have decreased blood flow to the heart. You already have a blockage, so that decreases the amount of blood getting to portions of the heart. And those patients will experience uh, some form of indigestion, discomfort, et cetera. And so that is another sign that you know, what they're experiencing, particularly if it occurs frequently with exertion or after meals, that's something that you at least want to get checked out and make sure it's not heart disease. Got you. Um, and I don't know if this is, you know, a, a, an actual thing, but I know we have a lot of um, mothers or pregnant women that watch this. Are there different signs for uh, maybe a woman that is pregnant and about to have a child or is it all the same? That's an excellent question. So there's a, you know, uh, you know, the, the sort of the classic scenario that we think about is a female who's pregnant and comes in in the setting of what we think is a heart attack. So they'll get, you know, the chest discomfort, neck going up to the neck, jaw, or back, or sometimes they just get it in the jaw or in the neck. Uh, and then we get concerned. We can check something in the blood that gives us a good sense that something's going on with the heart. Uh, and in that scenario, it is a, this patients can experience a heart attack, but it oftentimes to be because of something called a coronary artery dissection. And that's where actually a layer of the blood vessel wall is peeled away and closes off the blood vessel. That's a little bit of a different, you know, scenario than we're, when we talk about an actual blockage. But you know, the, the pregnant female who develops chest discomfort uh, that's not remitting and goes in to get evaluated, that's oftentimes what happens. Uh, do, you see, Go ahead. do you see a rise in heart disease cases with women who are pregnant just because the hormones and um, extra stress on the body? No, uh, definitely don't. It's just that one specific category where we see it. But in general, all comers, uh, generally not. Okay. All right. Just wanted to um, make that clear. Um, and, and you just said this a second ago, you know, we talked about, you know, high blood pressure and um, heart disease. What are the different what's the difference between high blood pressure, high cholesterol and heart disease? Because uh, a lot of people think it's all the same thing. Right. So high blood pressure is elevated pressure uh, in the arteries uh, that you know sort of feed off your heart. Um, and your heart has to basically pump against that extra pressure. 
that elevated pressure over time, you know, you have your arteries and they're used to, you know, by design, we're supposed to see a certain number of, of, of pressure. And when that pressure is elevated, the body begins to, to make these changes. And those changes can sometimes manifest itself in uh, ultimately going on to develop things like heart disease, et cetera. So it's really the pressure uh, uh, of, of, of uh, the blood vessels. I'm trying to explain this in a very simple way, but basically the pressure of the blood vessels outside of the heart um, uh, that they create by either dilating or constricting. And so when you know have a scenario where your, your pressure is too high, those vessels are, are tighter and it's harder for blood to get through something that's a little bit tighter. And so that's extra stress on the heart and prolonged stress for long periods of time. When we talk about heart attack, what we're talking about is basically a some form of reduced blood flow to a portion of the heart. Now, the heart is a muscle, and just like any muscle, it requires blood flow, it requires oxygen and nutrients. And if there's an, a blockage, you can imagine that the amount of nutrients that get past that blockage are reduced. Uh, and then if we do things like exercise, now you have a scenario where the heart's pumping more, it needs more nutrients to function, and you can't supply the amount of blood to get to, to satisfy the nutrient requirement, that's when we start to have problems. And so that is how you then go on to develop what's called a heart attack. And that's where you generally have a significant narrowing of a blood vessel, reduced blood flow, and then muscle cells starting to die off after the blockage. Uh, and then you mentioned uh, high cholesterol. High cholesterol yep. is just a, uh, we all have <clears throat> fats in our body or, or in, in different types of fatty acids and things of that nature. Uh, and uh, it's oftentimes kept in check by our cells. Our cells kind of regulate how much of the cholesterol we hang on to, how much of the fatty acids we hang on to. And there can be some scenarios where we hang on to a little bit more of that the cholesterol and the fatty acids than we should. And that cholesterol then deposits itself in areas that for whatever reason have elements of injury. So it will deposit itself in you know, an area in the blood vessel that maybe has a lot of injury because of the elevated blood pressure, et cetera. And with that, you then slowly start to get a buildup of the cholesterol in the blood vessel, which then leads to, you know, progressive uh, reduction in the size of the blood vessel, meaning uh, increased blockage, less size for the blood flow to actually pass through. And then that leads to some of the issues that we're talking about. So a lot of what you're describing is interconnected, but they are separate and distinct. Um, you know, one of the things that we were just talking about is high blood pressure. Um, and unfortunately, that is one of the things that really plagues the African-American community as well as Black women. Um, and when we think about high blood pressure, the first thing that we think of is like, oh, I had too much salt. Um, what are some other causes um, outside of salt? And what are some things that we can do about it? Yeah. So I think the, the biggest thing to to, to really highlight is the fact that genetics play a role. And, and you know, there are different genes and proteins involved in the body that help us regulate our blood pressure. And sometimes we can have uh, some defects within those genes or proteins, et cetera, that can contribute to elevated blood pressure. So there is a definite genetic component. So oftentimes if your mother had it, your grandmother, your father, that's something that you likely will develop uh, over time. And so being aware of the fact that that is part of your history and then trying to do things to mitigate it. You've mentioned uh, salt reduction, so reducing your uh, salt intake. I think some of the other things to mention are exercise, uh, is uh, in addition to diet and reducing your salt intake, exercise. And so we really push sort of exercise 30 minutes a day, five days a week, moderate intensity. And that uh, kind of relaxes the blood vessels to a certain extent and helps the blood pressure come down. Um, other things that might seem a little weird, but they actually work and have been, have been demonstrated to work is uh, uh, you know, um, uh, sort of yoga and um, uh, meditation, those types of things. If you take, you know, 15 minutes out for yourself in the morning, that has been shown to have effects in terms of reducing your overall vascular tone and keeping your blood pressure down throughout the day. Um, and then, you know, it's very simple. Try to minimize stress as best you can, whether it's at work or with family, you know, do things to keep yourself centered. And that in and of itself really will help to uh, keep your blood pressure down as well. And it's funny that you say that because literally that was about to be my next question is how does stress play in all of this? So the fact that you said, like, you know, do something to, you know, de-stress yourself, meditate, take some time away um, is great because I, I've heard and, you know, I've, I've seen that stress will literally bring on it. Will, stress will make you sick. Stress can make you sick. And, then you know, in other cultures like the Japanese they actually have a word for when you work yourself to death, right? And so that is the stress that you put on yourself to maybe make a certain deadline, you don't make it, and then you develop 
all this anxiety and stress around it and you know people can actually work themselves to death so this i mean there are terms for it in other cultures which means it's a very real thing and so with that as a backdrop i, I do think it's time for sometimes just to unplug take some time off from work even if you need a mental health day um those things are are important to keep you moving forward yeah most definitely i agree with you 110 <laughs> percent mental health days <laughs> I took one last week. That's why I'm just like, take the day. Um, you know, one of the things, because I'm a personal trainer, um, and one of the things that I always like to preach to people is I'm only as good for other people as I am to myself. So if I am like scatterbrained and if I'm stressed, I can't be good for anybody else. So, you know, to your point of like, you know, being effective at work, you have to make sure that you're good first. So that you can be as as effective as you need to be um, in all settings. So I just I I love that you said that. And I I want to piggyback on that because I think what you just said, that's a wonderful point. Uh, And I think there's so much encompassed in there. And another add on to that, and not necessarily another way to look at it, but an add on to that is, you know, take care of yourself. You'll be more poised to take care of others. Right. And as part of taking care of yourself is recognizing, at least in my mind, what things may affect you or your family and trying to prepare yourself for it. So, you know, uh, ensuring that we talked about all the things that you can do for yourself, diet and exercise and meditation. But also, if you have a high risk in your family, you may want to do simple things like have some aspirin in the house. And so if someone has a heart attack, you have a way to start the process of getting them treated, um, you know, before emergency medical services arise, before you can get them to a hospital. You may want to take some time and learn how to provide CPR. Right. And so if someone goes down in front of you, you know what to do. Right. And, and these are all part of a taking care of yourself and then b being a position to, uh, in a position such that you can take care of your, your loved ones if something arrives. You literally just pointed the finger at me and like because I, I I'm, I'm certified in CPR and first aid, but I don't have any, uh, you know, like Tylenol or aspirin or anything like that in the house. I'm the, and I know it sounds crazy. I'm the type of person, like if I get a headache, I'm just like, oh, I'm just going to sleep it off. But just thinking about, you know, some of these things that you're saying, sometimes it's a little bit more than just, and, and we do that in the in the black community. We're just like, oh, we're going to sleep it off. And a lot of these situations don't need to be sleep it off. You need to, you know, as much as you can prevent it in the, in the beginning, you know, try to do that. But, you know, if there is that situation where you do find yourself, you know, like you said, possibly having a heart attack, what can you do? to you know start the the aiding process before uh paramedics get there so i just uh, you were pointing the fingers at me because i (laughs) know but aspirin not tylenol aspirin full strength 325 have them chew it and and uh that starts the process working you're actually helping to treat them and uh as as things are moving along so aspirin thank you yeah i'm i'm one of those people i'm just like (laughs) I don't need it. Actually, you <laughs> need it, okay? Heard yeah, situations. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and again, just something good to have on hand. Um, you know, talking about things that affect you know the black community and women of color, um, especially you know African Americans and Hispanic women. Um, let's talk about diabetes because that's another big thing that plagues women of color, Hispanics, African American. Um, does this have an impact on heart health as well? Absolutely. So there's a direct correlation with the development of diabetes and development of heart disease. When you're at higher risk, 100 percent, you know, for sure, whenever you have also have diabetes added to your sort of medical history. Um, and so what I tell patients is, you know, there's two groups. So if you already have it, um, then your goal is to keep your sugars as low as possible. There's a number that we watch something called a hemoglobin A1C, which is just tells you how much sort of sugar residues you have on your red blood cells over time. And that kind of gives us a proxy for how high your blood sugars are. So your goal is to keep that hemoglobin A1C down as low as possible. Mm-hmm. If you are someone who has diabetes in your family and you know, you're, you're, you're starting to get a little bit older, mid thirties, forties, that's something that you may want to talk to your primary care physician about, about screening. So they can just send off a quick blood test and that'll tell them whether you're in the, you don't have any, you know, you haven't developed it or you're in the pre-diabetic phase, right? And so a lot of individuals in the pre-diabetic phase are at high risk for going on to develop diabetes. And so any interventions you can start to implement uh, are also good to start to be implemented at that phase. And I'll talk a little bit about some some potential diets that can actually help with improving and or reversing uh, um, heart disease and diabetes. At least there's some, uh, some limited data on, on some of that. Um, uh, but just being mindful of those numbers and how they may help or contribute, I should say, to you developing uh, heart disease is important. And then knowing how to mitigate that risk, how to lessen or decrease that risk by 
um, trying to adopt a diet uh, and, and safe exercise regimen to help extend your life, really, and give you a good quality of life. Um, I don't know if you want me to dovetail into to some of the, di the diets. No, please. Okay. Yeah, please. And so the, generally the three diets that I recommend and not necessarily in any order, because I think, you know, ultimately it's up to the individual to buy in and see this as a good thing. Uh, uh, the first is sort of the Mediterranean diet. We hear a little a lot about it. That's sort of more fish, more good, uh, good fats, um, uh, like, you know, fish oil and uh, flaxseed oil, et cetera. Um, uh, uh, more vegetables, more complex carbs, less of the simple carbs. And that's kind of the way that that diet is structured. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can still eat red meat and they recommend more sort of um, grass fed if you're going to go that route, if you're going to do chicken, lean cuts, turkey, et cetera. So there's flexibility in that, um, uh, that's, which some patients like, um, but it helps to get them back on, on track. The other is something called the anti-inflammation diet. Uh, and that's kind of a spinoff of the Mediterranean. And really what underlies that is the fact that inflammation in the body is the hallmark for diabetes. It's the thing that underlies it. So the hallmark for or, or you know, underlying uh, factor in heart disease and strokes uh, and people developing, you know, osteoarthritis, all these different you know, diseases that we start to uh, suffer from as we age. Inflammation seems to be sort of right there kind of controlling everything. So anything we can do to take in foods that help to minimize inflammation, and that generally tends to be foods that are high in antioxidants, um, that, that's a good thing to do and uh, something that I also recommend. Very small, uh, simple book, cheap book, something called The Complete Idiot's Guide to the Anti-Inflammation Diet. You can get it on Amazon or what have you. That uh, really will start to introduce uh, ways or, 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 or sort of methods that you can uh, start to employ and take on to help in, um, uh, improve your health overall. The last one, and probably the most striking one, uh, is the a plant based whole food diet. And that is the one where, you, you know, no, no, nothing that walk, basically. Um, so, you know, everything out from the ground. And in that one, it's actually been shown in certain scenarios to, re to uh, um, uh, 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 turn back the time on diabetes or, you know, sort of get rid of diabetes. And then uh, for heart disease, uh, actually have regression of some of those cholesterol deposits in the blood vessels over time. And so that's another diet uh, if patients are willing to go there out that I definitely recommend because it has proven benefits. So, yeah. Um, yeah. As a trainer, I would suggest, you know, looking into each and every and just like, you know, on if you don't have heart disease or, you know, just everybody looking at one of the diets, um, even if it's something that you don't do every single day, you know, maybe you do the Mediterranean diet this day and, you know, whole foods um, and vegetables this day, just really living more of a uh, natural whole life. No, so I completely um, love that you were able to, to share that with our viewers right now, because, um, you know, just even without anything, those are, you know, diets that you really should start incorporating into your, your daily life. That's correct. It can't hurt, it can only help. Yeah. Completely right. Um, when should a woman see a doctor? Uh, you, if I'm not, ha if I don't have any symptoms, or if I don't, you know, if I don't feel any type of way, and I'm talking about going back to um, heart disease, um, do I need to see a doctor about if it's something that you know is in my family? Um, I may have a little chest pain this day. Is this something that I need to, <laughs> to go see a doctor about, or should I wait until I really start experiencing symptoms continuously? Um, to get some help and some answers. I think uh, you raise an excellent question and it, it raises or brings up this point that I always try to drive home. And that is that the goal uh, with you know this discussion uh, and hopefully you, know, you trying to maintain your health is to ensure that you are paying attention to your body as best possible. Uh, and, and that will really guide a lot of things. So if you notice, hey, you know, six months ago, I could walk up them flight of stairs. Now I get halfway and I have to stop and rest and catch my breath. It's very different. That's not something that should be attributed to old age or getting older. There's something different. You know, um, if, you know, 20 years ago, you used to be able to run a marathon and now you can't, that's a little different. But six months ago, one year ago, difference, you notice, you know, a striking change in your ability to, to you know, carry in groceries, walk up a flight of stairs, go up a hill. That's something that should be addressed and should not be pushed uh, off. As far as when we should you know, start the screening, I think if you have a family history of heart disease, a family history of diabetes, a family history of high blood pressure um, uh, and strokes and uh, things of that nature in your family, you need to sort of start touching base with your physician around age 35. And they may not, there's nothing to do, but just make sure that 
They know you're thinking about it. They know that you know that it's high on your likelihood of developing it over time. And so they can start to look out for it. And you, you may not have anything done. There are no screening tests that I necessarily recommend. Once you hit about 40 is when we uh, should start having discussions about, well, if you're, you know, have this in your family, if you have one additional risk factor, maybe we should do some screening tests. And there's something called a coronary calcium score, which is just a CT scan, two minutes in a scanner, not, no needles or anything like that. And it looks at the calcium in your blood vessels and then gives us a sense because we know that oftentimes calcium and cholesterol deposits follow each other, whether you may have disease that needs to be addressed. And so that's a good screening tool there. You should have your A1C, which kind of tells us a little bit about your diabetes checked. Uh, you know, I think, you know, start around 35 or so uh, as you go up. Um, and then your uh, cholesterol levels also check. And there are tools that your primary care physician can use to help dictate something called an ASCVD risk score. And depending on how, you, how high your risk is, it may uh, recommend um, checking for certain things and also treatment for certain things. And so um, I would start there, kind of in that 35, 40 range, making sure you see your physician on an annual basis, letting them know about what's going on with you, not hiding anything and not trying to just attribute it to, to getting older. And it's OK for me to see my primary care physician, correct? Absolutely. Why you should be? Well, you know, because sometimes we hear like, "Oh, you need to go to this person and this person," and it's having to do that that run around of seeing 152 million people that really. I'm gonna be honest; it stresses me out. So yeah. you know, it's good to know, like, hey, you know, I can go to my primary care physician and really like have these conversations and discussions with them, and you know, if things need to progress from there, then they'll lead me down the right path. But a lot of times, it's Got to go here, got to go here, got to go here. And I'm just like, I'm too busy to go to all these places. Like, I just want to go to this person and, right and, here. And your thing is you let your PCP, your primary care physician know that. So sometimes they can work with you and say, OK, well, maybe this isn't necessary. Let's just focus on this for now. Right. And so that's what I mean by keeping those lines of communication open. And hopefully they'll be in a position where they can work with you to get the care uh, that you uh, absolutely need. If you were my mother's child, you have been going to a doctor every year since you were like five because she was a pediatric nurse. So we always went as kids, myself and my, my siblings. Um, so in my mind, it's it's never, you, it can't hurt, it can only help um, in terms of just making sure that you have regular check-ins. Yeah, um, I know you mentioned this a little earlier, but just wanted to see if there was anything else that we left off the list when it comes to heart disease and high blood pressure. Um, I know we talked about like exercising, changing the diet. Are there any other things um, that we can do to, to treat these? Yeah, exercising, changing the diet, uh, avoiding stressful situations, paying attention to our uh, body. And when we're the things that are going on, making sure that we have them address or at least tell somebody who who may be able to make some sense of it uh, and then allow them to help kind of help distill. When I mean by somebody, I mean a healthcare provider. Um, uh, uh, I would say that those are the hallmarks. If you have strong family history of disease, I think you owe it to yourself as well as your family members to, again, have an aspirin in the house and then try to get some 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 training on CPR. So if ever put in that situation, you know exactly what to do and how well to do it. Um, I think those would sort of be the hallmarks, uh, really paying attention to your health as best possible is, is probably the best thing that I can leave with you today. And one of the best ways to do that is taking yourself to your primary care physician and having conversations with them on an annual basis so that everybody knows what's going on. That's correct. Um, yeah, that's correct. Because we, again, we like to wait years and years and years to do stuff. And it's just like, no, go on an annual basis. I do have a question for you. And I don't know if this is related, but um, when we talk about like heart disease, um, and I know weight can have some effect on, you know, high blood pressure and high cholesterol. But does, you know, being overweight have an impact or an effect on um, chances of heart disease? Absolutely. So there, there, there is some association. It's not, you know, several fold risk, but obesity um, sort of tracks with a sedentary lifestyle, right? And so if you're not moving again, not doing the exercise that we we discussed, that would definitely increase your risk uh, um, of of developing heart disease. But it gets a little complicated because there's something called the obesity paradox, which probably is outside the scope of this. But suffice it to say that the extremely, the morbidly obese patients oftentimes don't have heart disease at all. And that's wow. not something that it's called the obesity paradox. Is that I don't know that we know what the mechanism is there. So it has to be sort of the right level of obesity, if you will, uh, that predisposes you. Um, but I think ultimately the way I look at it is it's not necessarily the obesity. It's the lack of activity that really uh, is the biggest thing there. Mm, very, very, very good point. And anybody at any weight can be sedentary. That's correct. Um, so very good point there. Um, 
if anybody watching right now, if they want to contact you, uh, possibly set up an appointment, talk to you a little bit more in depth, um, Dr. Finley, where can they do that at? All right. So please uh, feel free to contact me uh, at 301-810-0086. And that'll help facilitate an appointment with me. We can get you in pretty quickly, get you seen, and then figure out what needs to be done. Thank you again so much. Uh, DMV, Dr. Clarence Finley, Medical Director of the Cardiac Catheterization Lab and Program Director of Structural Health Disease at UM Capital Region Medical Center, hanging out with me in Girl Talk uh, Live today. Thank you again so much for just all of your wisdom, all of your knowledge, all of your expertise. Um, we definitely appreciate it. And to everybody watching, thank you for tuning in. Have a great evening. Thank you, Jackie.